What is up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy. Excited to be with you on another pod podcast episode, if I can talk. Uh, the voice is getting better. The voice is getting better every week. Uh, we've been battling the COVID over here, so we're, we're doing better. We're doing better over here. Um, hopefully, you're doing better, too. So <laughs> anyway, uh, excited to be with you again today. I bring on Danny Liu, who is awesome. He is coming from London to share this episode with us. We finally were able to connect on a time that works. Um, and he has over 20 years of experience in the transportation industry. He works currently for AECOM, uh, but worked for other companies before that. And in this episode, we talk a lot about becoming a PN, or professional engineer in the UK area. And so if that's ever been an interest to anybody, or if anybody lives over there is interested in becoming a PNG, uh, Danny details all the, the steps that need to take place for uh, an engineer that's starting out to become a professional engineer over there. He also runs a website called civilengineeringmentor.com. And I believe I screw that up in the episode, but definitely check it out, civilengineeringmentor.com, where he helps mentor those that are sh striving to become professional engineers. And so uh, we detail all this in the episode. We also talk about great advice and tips for any engineer at any level, really, to upgrade their career and uh, really to become a great mentor for those around us. So anyway, I really enjoyed my conversation with Danny. I know you will, too. And uh, come check it out. It's all coming up right after this. All right, we are going, Danny. Thanks for jumping on the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. I appreciate you jumping on and doing this with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know you're across the pond, and uh, I, I love to bring guests on from around the world just kind of get their experience on being a professional civil engineer uh, outside of the United States and kind of get your opinion about things uh, to help people. I know I, there are many people that want to practice, you know, outside of the United States too, and work on some fun projects in other places. And there's many people outside of the United States that are civil engineers that want to hear good civil engineering news. So thanks for, thanks for doing this with me. No, thank um, you for having me. And, um, well, hopefully you get to hear about, um, proper civil engineering projects from the home of civil engineering. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, well, Danny, before, you know, we start diving into this, why don't you tell me a little bit about how you found your way into civil engineering yourself? Um, you know, is this a passion you kind of grew up? Were you good at math? Was there a, a father or a relative that was, you know, kind of helping you along the way? How did you find yourself into this world? Well, it's quite an interesting story, actually, because um, when I was at school, I actually wanted to be an accountant. Um, mm. I was actually really good at maths. So I thought, well, OK, let's be an accountant. Um, when I was 15, um, we were um, all required to undertake three weeks work experience um, in an industry that we wanted to go into. So mm -hmm. what we, what you call an unpaid internship, um, I'd secured a placement with an accountancy firm local to me. Um, I was really excited, um, to, to start the placement, but a week before I was supposed to start, they pulled out. Um, so I then had to scramble around with, um, my teachers looking for another placement. Um, I managed to secure work experience with a small structural engineering firm. Um, and I was amazed by kind of the engineering drawings um, that I had in the office. So this was before the days of CAD. So we talk talking mm. the huge drawing boards, the set squares, the pens. I was just fascinated by the level of detail in the drawings. Uh, and I was going out on site um, because it was a small structural engineering firm. We were really looking at kind of um, underpinning houses, looking at foundations, nothing major. Um, but all that just kind of really interested me. Um, and then that what made me go and study maths and physics at A-level, and then go on to study civil engineering at university. Wow. So you took a tour of this place. You um, you realized there was some interest there. And then you went back, you, you know, to uh, what teachers and told them that you wanted to change course a little bit or you just No, going. so this is when I was still at school. So then what yeah. happens at the end of school is then you choose your um, A-levels, which is your study before you go to university. And then that's what made me decide to kind of go down the maths and physics route and then go into civil engineering. Um, I think it's because I, I, 
as a civil engineer, you, you, you make changes in society and people can see that. And then I was going to people's houses, um, looking at the foundations and they were kind of really grateful, um, and, uh, on, on things that we do. And that's kind of what made me want to go into civil engineering. You, you I love people it. say it's like people see the fruits of your labor, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's hard to say other professions, but you know, civil engineering is really affect the world we live in in a manner that the public sometimes doesn't recognize, but when it's gone, they definitely recognize that, you know, yeah. whether it's roads <laughs> issues, uh, anything like that. So, that's awesome. So Danny, take us to where you are today and what you do for a living. Right. So since I graduated, I joined a company called Oscar Faber, which over years has now been acquired by Acom. Um, so mm. I've worked um, with uh, consultancies, private developers, local governments. So it's a career that's uh, spanned 21 years and counting, hopefully a few more years to go. Um, <laughs> and I've been a chartered engineer for uh, 13 years. So. I have a um, highways and infrastructure background, and that includes the design and management of urban highways and utilities. That's great. Wow. So, um, so would you say your emphasis is more, uh, I guess, in the in the transportation industry? Then is that where your emphasis kind of is? Yes. So we would call that kind of a traffic engineering and highway engineering in this country. Okay. Okay. Um, what uh, what what do you think is really challenging about being a civil engineer uh, with your 20, 21, 22 years of experience? Uh, so over the years, it's really about dealing with challenging stakeholders. So the kind of work that I do is um, we have to undertake public consultations. So when mm. we have a um, highway proposal, we um, we have to consult with the members of the public to kind of get their views on proposed highway measures and also get mm -hmm. their support. Now, what I've noticed is a lot of people, because they drive, they think that they're very good highway engineers and they come up <laughs> to me and they come up with several options um, to where, where they believe they can solve a problem. And so <laughs> my role is to explain the problem. Um, and then um, also one thing is um, people like highway improvements, but just not on their street. They don't want to be disrupted. <laughs> so um, my challenge is to explain the problem to them. Um, invite solutions from them um, so they, they feel they're part of the design process so that uh, and then explain the pros and cons and then when it goes to consultation you generally get a better a greater chance of support so this is really about uh, testing your communication skills speaking in a non-technical language and also use illustrations rather than just here's a CAD drawing here's what we're trying to do what well, I try I try and simplify things for people and help them understand hmm. That makes sense. <clears throat> I imagine in the U.S. and over there in London that the process is probably very similar in terms of getting some of these projects uh, approved and, and reviewed by the public and also how maybe probably how they're funded. Uh, could you speak to that at all? I mean, I imagine they're they're pretty similar, but uh, imagine government is is helping to fund a lot of these major highway bridge reconstruction projects. And here in the United States, I know they passed big legislation for uh, a lot of new infrastructure. Uh, and so just curious your thoughts on on that process uh, over there, how it works and yes. um, things of that nature. So working for a local authority, um, our, we get um, funded by um, government, which is through taxes. And um, that's when you get the residents saying, I pay my taxes. I see. Um, I don't want an electric vehicle charging point outside my house because I don't have an electric vehicle. So why are you wasting my tax money mm. on this X, Y, Z? Um, so that's what makes it more challenging. And also kind of, um, I relish that challenge in kind of um, explaining things to the public and um, making a change to society. I like it. What do you think is the most rewarding part of being a civil engineer? It's really, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is um, going through the design process um, and then seeing things get built and then driving past it later and saying to a uh, family that uh, this I've done this. They get bored after a while. but Put your hand on your cool. heart, family. I, I, I made that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's the, the most rewarding part for me is um, 
which is I wouldn't have got that from um, a career in accountancy is seeing what's what you've done out out in the street. That's true. I I do really enjoy that. I think that's one of the most rewarding things about being a civil engineer as well. And what you know, what you build is going to last for a long, long time. And so people will will see that for a very, very, very long time. So, yeah, I, yeah. I totally agree with you. Uh, Danny, could you take us through the process? You mentioned being a, a PNG. What's the process of becoming that uh, over there? How do, how do you become a professional engineer? Okay, so in the UK, so we have the Institution of Civil Engineers, which we call ICE. So that's the professional body for civil engineers. So um, it's the oldest professional body in the world because it was created in 1818. Mm -hmm. um, so we have three levels of professional qualification and all that is based on your academic qualifications that you have. So we have engineering technician, which is EngTech. We have incorporated engineer, which is iEng, and chartered engineer, which is CEng. Mm. So for engineering technician, you need what's equivalent of a foundation degree. For incorporated engineer, you need an approved Bachelor of Engineering degree. And for chartered engineer, you need an approved Master of Engineering degree or Bachelor of Engineering degree and an accredited master's degree. And once you graduate, you need to undertake a period of work experience. And this is where you develop the skills, knowledge and experience to become professionally qualified. And we call this the initial professional development or IPD process. Hmm. And then once you've completed IPD, you can apply for your professional review. And for iEng and CEng candidates, this includes a presentation, an interview, and a written communication task. Wow. And that is done through ICE that they present That's that through. Yep. Interesting. And what how long is that process? Um, you know, to get your work experience before you do that presentation? It depends on the candidate. Um, I've known people do it in three or four years, which is pretty mm -hmm. fast. Um, I I have to admit, I slowed down a bit. Um, <laughs> and then it took me eight years. Um, there's people that take 12, 13, 20 years. Um, it's entirely up to you. I just recommend people get it out of the way as soon as possible um, because the more senior you become in your company, the more hours that you generally work and the harder it is for you mm -hmm. to find time to complete your training that makes sense and that's the same over here in the united states you know the sooner you can um knock out becoming a professional engineer the better because uh over here they have you know they require examinations and the longer you push that off the longer you're out of school the more and more you forget and the harder it is to get back into the routine uh, correct, plus yeah. plus they combine the um work experience so you have to kind of do both but um it's, I, I love hearing the difference of how to do that. And I'm curious if you know, because I don't know, if you are a professional engineer in the United States and they say, uh, you know, I wanted to move to England or something, would you know of a process that um, is that is that looked at as an equivalent thing or would I have to apply to become a PNG? Do you know anything about that process? You'd have to look at the IC website. Um, I believe there is a way to transfer over um, to the equivalent in the UK, um, mm. but that's something that the IC will be able to guide you with. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's jump into a website you started called Engineering Mentor. Uh, how, how? What was the inspiration behind that? And okay, so, uh, what do you do? So, as I mentioned earlier, graduates need to complete their initial professional development in order to go to their professional review. So IPD, we measure that against a set of attributes. And for chartered engineers and incorporated engineers, there's seven attributes um, that they are measured against. And examples of that would be um, understanding and practical application of engineering, management and leadership, and health and safety and welfare. So yeah. there are three ways to complete IPD. So the most common way is to join an engineering company which has an in-house approved training scheme. So that way you're signed with a supervising civil engineer, a delegated engineer, and they will provide you support and guidance. The second approach is what we call mentor supported training. And that's where a graduate has to organize their own training with the support of an IC approved mentor. And then there's a third way, which is called a career appraisal. This is for more experienced engineers 
who have enough experience to complete IPD straight away. So then I realized that there were many civil engineers out there in the industry that work for companies that don't have a training scheme. So mm. I then applied to be an approved mentor with the ICE um, so that I can support these graduates via mentor supported training and the career appraisal route. So then I designed a website which provides information on how to become professionally qualified, information on the IPD process and details on the professional review. And the most popular page on my website is tips on how to complete the attributes. That's one that gets visited the most. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a professional review of the ICE. So I'm up to date with the requirements of the review process and I undertake mock reviews for candidates as well. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, so, uh, th and that was the drive behind doing the website then is to, to help others become professional, you know, PN, PNGs over there as well. I mean, that's kind of yes. sounds like the drive. So in my, um, one of my previous companies, I worked for a developer and, um, we had quite a few engineers in there, but they had never had a training scheme. So wow. I then, um, introduced the training scheme for that company. Um, and then. I then realized that there was a lot of people that worked in work for private developers as well that um, don't have a training scheme because a lot of developers, because it's kind of a lot of vertical build, um, they were employing architects and not many mm. engineers. Um, so I found there was a gap in the market. And then I um, and also completing the attributes um, is quite difficult for quite a few candidates because the attributes are quite generic because it's supposed to be designed for civil engineers in all industries. So could you, could you take us through some of those attributes just so people are aware? Yeah, so it could be like um, uh, involvement in the, uh, the design process or give me an example where you um, had to uh, come up with a problem, um, look at the sustainability side of it, um, continuous improvement in sustainable development measures and the candidates come up to me and said, I, I don't quite understand what that means. Um, or they say, um, uh, I've got in this example, is that good enough? And then my role is to say, well, that's not good enough to be chartered engineer level. So you need gotcha. to come up with a more robust example, uh, just choosing between a 13 ton crane and a 20 ton crane it's not good enough to be a chartered engineer. You need to kind of give me a more complex solution and your involvement in the problem, the decisions you made and how you've evaluated the solution. That makes sense. Why, why do you think a lot of employers don't have this training program set up? Is it just not on the radar or are firms just too small to really deploy a training program? Uh, I think it's... Uh, I believe some of them don't want to put one in, either don't want to put one in or don't expensive. know the process. It's not, no, it's not expensive. What you need is a supervising civil engineer, so a lead civil engineer to drive the process. Hmm. So uh, I believe that's what's holding them back. Um, and that's where I fit in is you don't need to have an in-house training scheme if you want to have your, your employees chartered or professionally qualified. There are mentor, there are IC approved mentors out there that can help you help your graduates without you implementing a training scheme. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so if I'm a beginning engineer, I'm just starting out and I'm trying to find my way through the civil engineering world. Uh, is there a, some advice you might have for someone that's trying to discover where they fit into this civil engineering world? If there's a specific niche that they like over another or even if they have found themselves in, you know, maybe they're neck deep into civil engineering, but maybe they don't love it and they want to try something different within the world of civil engineering. Um, what advice would you have for them? Right. So for those, uh, I get I get a lot of inquiries from people that are, that are at school that uh, mm -hmm. want to go into civil engineering. Um, I would I would suggest for them to go on the ICU website to find out a bit more. Um, about it. Yeah, there's a lot of trade journals out there as well. Um, so that helps you find out kind of what we do as civil engineers. For those that are already in the industry and um, want to stay as a civil engineer, but go into kind of a different field, um, I would say go for it. Because um, if you're not happy with what you're doing, but you want to stay as a civil engineer, then uh, research this other opportunity, these other 
kind of niche that you're talking about. Um, seek ops, try and find us, speak to your company, find out where they offer this opportunity. And if they don't, don't be scared to move on. You, you're in charge of your career. Don't let your company be in charge of it. That's that my sense. advice. And, and, and this is kind of how it works over here, but as a civil engineer, are there other disciplines that you could branch off into, whether it's project management or um, even management itself or other, other kind of avenues that you see civil engineers take throughout their career? Yeah, so you, I, I've, I have colleagues that have gone from um, civil engineers. They've actually moved to uh, be a quantity surveyors. They've actually got, gone and uh, worked for project management, pure project management companies, and then diverse into other industries um, using their project management skills. Um, I even have uh, friends at university that studied uh, four years at university and then went into finance because oh. um, civil engineers, um, we have such sought after um, skills and experience so that um, they went straight into finance and they're earning a lot more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good point um you do bring up a good point maybe we could talk about that for okay. a little bit um one of the big pain points i see that a lot of engineers are bringing up right right now is is pay um and how that compares to other industries let's say an attorney or a lawyer or even a doctor where you know, civil engineers um as we stamp things as we approve things you know the liability of that is on us and uh, you know, we're we're trying to keep public safety um, at the forefront of our mind. Uh, there's a lot of lives sometimes at stake when you're designing roads, bridges, buildings that really do affect the public welfare. Um, I guess, what do you think about how engineers are are paid in the industry? Is is it a race to the bottom when projects are bid on by co companies and try to get uh, a cheaper project? Get try to get cheaper engineering and it kind of trickles down or what how do you feel engineers are paid in general well this is a quite a common debate over here as well so um mm. like, like we know lawyers and doctors are respected more and paid more as well um when i was at school I was having a debate with um some of my friends about what degrees we're going to go and study and i was arguing how important civil engineering was um, my friend said that you know he believed medicine is more important and more respected degree because um, if he had to go to hospital, he would want the doctor to have a um, degree. And I was saying, well, okay, what kind of qualifications would you like the civil engineer that designs and build the bridge that you're going to be driving over later? So it's, you know, people don't realize that as civil engineers, we make massive contributions to society. Um, but we're not, they're not very noticed. So, I mean, what I want to say to people is, you know, next time you travel to work or school, you know, have a look around you and you'll notice kind of what a massive impact civil engineers have, um, you know, on our daily lives. Um, I also think um, there's, there's not enough famous figures out there um, that promote civil engineering, and that's at a national or international level. So what I would suggest, you know, as civil engineers, we, we should be promoting ourselves to friends and family to explain the challenges that we face every day in our projects. Um, and you're saying that civil engineers, you know, are we paid um, enough? Um, I just want to say that, you know, there's, there's teachers and nurses that deserve more credit in society. I think as civil engineers, we're glad we are paid well, uh, mm -hmm. not as well as doctors and lawyers, but there's a lot of industries out there that are paid a lot less than us. Well, that's very true. Very true. I, and I, I um, honestly believe civil engineering will provide you with a great career for your entire, your entire career. And there are many avenues to, to move up in a company and you'll be just fine. Are, you know, are, am I suggesting that you're going to be filthy rich being a civil engineer? Probably not unless maybe you own the business uh, that's doing the work, but I think you will have a outstanding career in this field. And um, people do get upset sometimes when you look at our contribution to society and how that equates to kind of other disciplines that are out there. But the, I think um, civil engineering is a great field to be in. So I, I totally agree with I you. I agree. Um, Danny, is there, um, 
is there a resource out there that you have found very helpful for engineers to to pay attention to, whether it's a book, a website, or a course, or anything? So um, I recommend to all engineers to read the uh, relevant codes and standards to to the field that they're in. Um, and the reason why I say this is because we're going to test you in a professional review, so you've got to be up to speed on that. Um, so members of the IC they have access to uh, the IC's virtual library, and there's a wealth of kind of books and journals there as well. Um, and not don't just read civil engineering. Um, you can go outside of that as well. So at the moment, I'm, I've started reading a book um, that's written by a colleague of mine. Uh, it's called Life Me Remix by Mark Wilkinson, and this is a straight talking self help book, which is helping me reevaluate my life and make a change for the future. So books like that to help you motivate yourself to do even better in your work. I love it. That's great advice. Um, <clears throat> I was just um, thinking while, while you were talking, um, I know we've hammered a lot about the process of becoming a PNG and I'm curious if, if is there anything else on the top of your mind that you would love to share um, with those that are trying to become a PNG? Uh, on the process of how to do it or any anything like that? Well, I would, so what I say to my uh, my kind of mentees at the moment is um, you know, set aside time every week to do your training. Um, if you set aside 45 minutes to an hour every week um, and continue to do that, you'll get through your training a lot quicker. Mm. Um, I know there's pressures of work. Um, I know you know, I've got mentees in their twenties that want to go out partying. I mean, sure. I, I, they shouldn't stop doing that. I say to them, you do your work Monday to Friday, including your training work Friday night to Sunday night. That's yours. Um, but if you get yourself into a routine, you'll get it done quicker and then you can then progress to the next stage of your career. That's great. Perfect. Well, Danny, uh, I appreciate this. What's the best way for our CEA audience to connect with you if they had some questions about anything we've talked about today? So you can visit my website, which is uh, www.civilengineeringmentor.com. It's got my email address. You can find me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, big or small. I love it. Danny, thanks for uh, jumping on. I know our time difference can affect how we, we get together, but we've made this work. So I do appreciate you jumping on and doing this with me. We'll uh, hopefully have you on in another episode. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Danny. See you.